Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 99. Writing should be an adventure, shrouded in mystery and uncertainty, blessed with amazing grace. Sid Field. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Videoblocks. Now, Videoblocks is a subscription-based stock media company that gives you unlimited access to premium stock footage everyone could afford. If you're looking for like extra exterior shots or things that you might want to incorporate into any of your projects, whether it be a narrative, documentary, music videos, commercials, these guys got you covered. They've got unlimited daily downloads from a library of over 115,000 HD video clips, as well as a huge selection of After Effects templates for like opening credits, uh, motion graphics titles, company logos, as well as motion backgrounds as well. It's pretty amazing. And at, on average, uh, subscribers pay less than a dollar per download in a course of a year. And the content does not get stale. They're constantly adding new content to the library every month. So it keeps it keeps it very, very fresh and you always have something new to look forward to. And everything you download is 100% royalty free. Even if your subscription is canceled, you have unrestricted usage rights for anything you want to do, including personal projects and commercial projects. And you keep whatever you download and maintain the usage rights forever. Now, Video Blocks is offering the tribe a yearly subscription for 99 bucks. That's 50 bucks off the usual price tag just for you guys, just for the tribe. That's less than 10 bucks a month. So to get this deal, just head over to videoblocks.com slash hustle. That's videoblocks, V-I-D-E-O blocks.com forward slash hustle for this exclusive offer. And don't forget to go to freefilmbook.com. That's freefilmbook.com to download your free filmmaking audiobooks from Audible. Now today, guys, on the show, we have Jeff Bolo from Fast Screenplay. He has also written a book called Writing Fast, How to Write Anything in Lightning Speed. Now, Jeff's been a, uh, he's an independent producer. Uh, he's also an actor and a screenwriter. And as an actor, uh, he was in one of my favorite 90s, uh, borderline 80s, 90s film called Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead, starring a very young Christina Applegate. And it was, I mean, such a fun movie back in the day. I'll put a link on it in the uh, in the show notes if you guys haven't seen it. It's super fun. But I wanted to bring Jeff on the show because he uh, he wrote this amazing book and he has this system called the Fast Screenplay, which is uh, about your setup. There, there's seven distinct phases. There's the setup, there's the focus, there's the apply, strengthen, tweak, alignment, and payoff. Uh, and the setup is setting yourself up to write a screenplay uh, any producer can use. And that's his big, that's his big um, point is you write for a producer. You write for the movie to get made as opposed to just writing just for the sake of writing or just writing in a vacuum like it's maybe it'll get sold, maybe it won't get sold, who knows. But his ideas are really interesting, and I wanted to come on the show to kind of talk about his method and his style of how he writes a screenplay. And uh, it's been very successful for a lot of people. And like all different systems, everyone, no one, no one has the magic bullet on this is the absolute way to be successful as a screenwriter. So you always got to listen to everybody and listen to everybody um, and, and and listen to other people's ideas and see what you can come out with it. So that's why I wanted to get Jeff on the on the um, on the show because uh, his techniques are very interesting and that he's going at it as a fast process. Also intrigued me because I know screenwriting it can be a little bit laborious, to say the least. So I don't want to keep mumbling along. So without further ado, here is my interview with Jeff Bolo. Jeff, thank you so much for taking out the time to uh, jump on the uh, the podcast. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Jeff, tell me how you got into the film business in the first place, this crazy business. <laughs> <laughs> how I got into the film business? Well, I was a little kid, mm-hmm. and uh, I was dreaming of being a movie star, and I decided uh, to get an, to, to pursue acting, and I started acting when I was about 12. 
Okay. So uh, I grew up in LA, so it's been around me all my life, and uh, just started pursuing that. Got some work as a as a kid actor, and fell in love with the filmmaking process, and started making my own short films, and um, got bit by the travel bug, and moved to Australia, mm-hmm. uh, where I tried to make an independent film with a friend of mine. We spent about seven years trying to make this indie film. Oh, man. I've heard that story before. Yeah, I can imagine. We ended up abandoning it in post-production because by the time we had gotten near to finishing, uh, it had sort of already become a bit obsolete. Some of the references were like structural story-based references were out of date and that kind of thing. And just we sort of went, okay, well, that was our film school, I guess, more or less. Right. That was a long film school. Yeah, very long <laughs> film school, painful film school too. I've had, I mean, I've been in post for about twenty years, and I've seen so many of those kind of stories. Like, but I've never heard seven years. Seven years is the record now. I've yeah. heard, I've heard three. You know, we've been doing this for three or four years, and we're like, oh man, that must just be painful. Well, well we were doing it for three or four years, and then that sort of you know drags on because at a certain point, I mean, the biggest problem that I'm, you know, you run out of money, and you've yeah. got to keep. You yeah. got to keep working to pay to generate the money to pay the bills and keep it going. So it just you know it becomes weekends and evenings and you know it's vacation. Like, it's like a really bad cocaine habit. You just have it's, to keep working to pay for the drug, <laughs> to, but that's not going anywhere yet. But I have to keep paying. To, it's like it's a vicious, well, vicious cycle. <laughs> I've never had that habit, so I can't. Me neither, sir. That, but, Me, I've uh, only seen Scar. I've only seen Scarface, so this is where exactly. I'm getting my reference from. From. My, <laughs> from movie references, I think that's true. <laughs> Um, now, I, with, when you say you were an actor, um, you were in one of my favorite movies growing up. Oh. <laughs> Don't tell mom the babysitter's dead. There you go. For, I said uh, I said the immortal, ridiculous line: "Park it yourself, Metallica breath." Yes, it's. <laughs> I'm sure a highlight. Uh, <laughs> oh, I can't tell you. I tried to get them to change that line, and the director was pretty adamant. So I went, "All right." And uh, it turns out, there you go. It's the only. It's my it's my one memorable thing from from five ten years of being an actor. So, so if uh, and that came out in what in the late eighties or early nineties? I think. It was well, that. it was it's it came out. It, we shot it in nineteen ninety. It came out in ninety one mm-hmm. at, at basically the same time as Terminator Two. Right. So, um, and, and it was actually a very it was a big hit for what it was. It was a well. Big, it, I mean, they made it was a relatively low budget that they mm-hmm. made it on, right. so it certainly made its money back mm-hmm. just barely, I guess, at mm-hmm. the at the box office. But then uh, it was it was co financed by HBO Films, so mm-hmm. HBO right. just ran it and reran it and reran it on on HBO in the early days, right? And so uh, it sort of mm-hmm. developed this I think cult, cult following over the years through that largely, and right. it's bizarre to me that people. Still remember that film? Today. Oh no! Well, I mean, I was working at a video store uh, ah. in, in '91, so I'm very well aware of that movie. And <laughs> and of course, like everybody else at that time in in, in history, I had a crush on Christina Applegate. So yes, uh, I had a crush on Christina Applegate too. Yeah, and she was still just <laughs> the married to a children girl, and and she just had her and she ran with it with that movie. So, um, sorry, I don't mean to geek out, guys. About no, uh, don't okay. tell tell mom the babysitter's that. <laughs> By the way, if you haven't seen it, uh, and you're a '90s kid, uh, you should definitely. Uh, Definitely watch it. It's a it wonder. really does capture that era pretty well. I oh. think it's it, it's uh, there's something there's something tangible about it. Like texturally, it's 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 interesting. It's there. I mean, it's not you know not the greatest movie of all time, but it's, oh god, it's no. fun. It's it still fun. it still had it still had some of the '80s stank on it, but yes. it was it wasn't it was in a full '90s movie, but it had a little bit of '80s stank slapped on. Just all those movies in '90,90, '91, '92, 92, they still had that '80s. Uh, well, I re- I remember somewhere someone had called it the last. 80s teen comedy. So yeah, even, that though, makes sense. even though it was made in the 90s. <laughs> no, that makes perfect sense, actually. That makes actually perfect. Yes, yeah, like I always say, like, you know, 1980, that's not really the 80s. 80s didn't start till maybe 81, 82. Exactly. You still got the stank of the 70s laying around. Right. So. <laughs> we haven't figured out what the 90s are yet, so right. we're still doing the 80s. Thing. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So um, so you moved to Australia. Um, I have to ask you, how is the film business down there? Like, how is it to make movies and well, run a production company and stuff. You know, the film industry in Australia is uh, – the thing with Australia is it's a much smaller country. So there's sure. only – you know, compared to, what, 300-something million people in, in the U.S., mm-hmm. there's 25 to 30 million in Australia. So everything gets it gets scaled down almost by factor of 10, kind of a thing, simply because – um, there's, you know, the audience, the homegrown audience isn't big enough to sustain 
you know, the kinds of budgets that are made in from Hollywood films, that sort mm-hmm. of thing. So it almost the, the industry there almost has an indie feel throughout, okay. except that there's this um, government funding sort of mechanism woven into the DNA of the industry. So, so the way screenwriters, for example, think about making money in Australia is they think about getting funding from the government, to, you know, a <laughs> uh, $10,000 for a draft sort of thing, you know, so it's, no, it's, you got so, No, you're kidding me. Really? They well, pay, uh, it's it's really? kind of that way. So it's, so everyone is like competing, I guess, for government dollars, right. which is, you know, disconcerting for someone like me who comes from LA and has this sense of, you know, I want to make, you know, commercially viable films that have artistic merit and all that sort of thing. So, um, to, to have to sort of fit into that, it's, it's difficult. So what ends up happening is, is, you know, you've got writers who are writing for something other than what someone like me is looking for generally by and large. Right. So the great challenge I think of the Australian film industry is, I mean, the film industry anywhere, I guess, is making a living while you're trying to make your films. (laughs) Um, but there, I think because it's smaller, the upside of it is also smaller. So it doesn't attract as many people. So it's a thinner field in which to play, I guess. I mean, I, it, it, they're very serious. They take it very serious. There's some great quality, particularly in the performing arts there, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, which makes for a very robust community. But it's because it's a little small and a little parochial. It's very it's it's hard for it's hard to build something and sustain it. They have distribution troubles. It's you know Australians the Australian audience often. Um, doesn't necessarily embrace Australian film because <laughs> it's, you know, first of all, the marketing dollars spent by the studios and the Hollywood films, you know, all the, all the American films are coming down there with these enormous budgets mm-hmm. and just blanketing press coverage. So the little Australian film, even in Australia has a real hard time Cracking. getting noticed and, mm-hmm. and getting heard. And it's in, so in some ways it really reflects the indie arena across the board. Got you. So in other words, if you made an indie film in Australia, you would have to bring it to Sundance to be big again in Australia. <laughs> kind of, yeah. It's 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 a little ironic that way. That's it's definitely true. The 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 films that have had breakout success really actually do succeed at overseas film festivals first. Right. So, well, I remember Crocodile Dundee was the biggest hit in Australia for a long time. Uh, it was well, it was, but that's sort of a US Australian exactly, production. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. That and was, and it's similar with things like Baz Luhrmann films, sure. you know, Australia or, you know, uh, Moulin Rouge or those kind of – like it's, yes, technically Australian, but most of the money it's comes US. from the US. Of so course. You, so that it's a – if you're talking about truly Australian homegrown product, it's mm-hmm. – um, you know, the budgets are smaller and they're, and they're more niche and it's – it's harder to find that audience, so it's a struggle. It's a it's a real struggle. And now, do you do you work uh, in New Zealand as well? Do you jump in back and forth? Yeah. So when I moved down there, I ended up migrating to New Zealand. Mm-hmm. So I lived in New Zealand for many years, and I've you know directed TV there, and I've acted in TV commercials and shows and stuff mm-hmm. there. So mm-hmm. it's um, I but you know then you're scaling it down to a population of four million people. Right. It's even smaller so, than Australia. <laughs> Yeah. So one of the, so one of the big problems, and I think this is, I think it gives me an interesting perspective on all this is if your market is small, you, in order to make something at a larger scale or something that, that uh, resonates with audiences wider, you really have to have almost a a global perspective on it Mm -hmm. rather than Mm -hmm. The perspective of the local. the The challenge of that is that we want to see local stories, and so if you you know this is that whole idea of stories with universal themes, right? Mm-hmm. Like universal themes are best expressed through specific local. You know, right. if you if you tell a local story that resonates culturally locally, there's a great film. I don't know if you ever saw it out of New Zealand called um, Whale Rider. 
No, yeah, of course. It's a wonderful film. Fantastic film. It's so very specifically New Zealand. It's very specifically the Maori culture. It's mm-hmm, very mm-hmm. specifically uh, – it's it's small and indie, but it it's themes that we that resonate, right? So right. it's the parent – the parent child relationship and the, where do I fit in, in, in my culture now that the culture isn't quite what it once was and all those kinds of things. We can relate to that, whether we're in Australia, whether we're in the U S we can relate to that story, but yet it's a very specific local story. I think that is, that's a great takeaway for, for filmmakers. Now, what, now what drew you to kind of get into the storytelling aspect and the screenwriting aspect of things? Well, when I was in Australia and I had a, a good friend of mine down there and I were wanting to make a film and I was waiting for him to get his, I don't know if I can use the word shit, no. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but uh, waiting for him to get his, uh, get his ass stuff. gear. His stuff together. His stuff together. Exactly. His stuff together. Um, so, you know, I was waiting and waiting and waiting and, and I just got very frustrated. I, I felt at a certain point that I was like, you know, I grew, I grew up in LA. So to be sitting in New Zealand going, what am I doing here? You know, right. uh, at a certain point, it's like, I, I just need to write something and we need to go try to make it. So I did that. I don't particularly love writing. Mm-hmm. I'm, I think I'm good at it, but I, it's not where my passion lies. My passion is in, uh, directing and producing. And, and so, mm-hmm. um, so when we, when we were in about three or four years into production and post-production on that film uh, that we ultimately abandoned. I started looking for other scripts and uh, I put out a call. I was back in Australia at this point, put in a call Australia wide looking for screenplays and got in probably about 300 scripts Mm -hmm. that knowing how hard it was for me to write, I committed to reading every word of every script that came in. Oh my gosh. And I will never do that again because it quickly becomes apparent that there's no if most people don't know what they're doing. Of course. Here um, here in LA as well. <laughs> here in LA as well. <laughs> Absolutely. It's they don't have a, a um a monopoly on not knowing what they're doing. It's LA is <laughs> very much the same way. <laughs> exactly. But the but when you as you start reading the stuff, you look at it from the perspective of the reader and the perspective of someone going, I want to make a film. Let me see if there's something that I can find out there because I don't want to have to write something again. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you start to see all the problems and you start to realize that, uh, you know, I can, I can get 30 pages in and realize there's no point in reading any further. And then as you read more, you go, I really only need to read 10 pages and I don't need to go any further. And eventually I realized that, you know, I can actually determine whether or not a script is legitimately viable Mm-hmm. in about two sentences. Mm-hmm. Like it's really that easy to determine. And and it's now cut to 16 years later and my production company has a submissions form on the website and we've had submissions uh, from all around the world, over 25,000 submissions. Mm-hmm. And literally I have found le- about 20 projects. <laughs> and you go, okay, at a certain point, um, so many the, it's, it's pretty much, you can, and this is the, this is the reason producers don't want to hear the pitch. This is the the reason people don't want to read your screenplay is because 99.9% of them are awful. So it's more, not awful, but just unusable. Mm-hmm. So the, not viable, not a viable product. They're not viable. And, and even if they are viable, they're not viable for that producer at that moment. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so it, Ultimately, they're kind of right to say, I'm not going to read your, your material, mm-hmm. which creates that catch-22. So here I am in Australia saying, well, okay, but I need scripts. I mean, we need we – need, what are we going to make? I don't want to sit down and – so I have this ambition to, to start an independent film studio mm-hmm. that would make between three and six films a year. This was my goal back 16, 17 years ago as well. Mm-hmm. And – the if you've seen my TED talk, that's those are the kinds of films that I want to make, right? So I had this sort of big vision for changing the future and not changing the future, but preparing people for what's to come. 
Right. I want to make movies that inspire us for what I believe to be a radically different future that's on its way to us. So can, so, you, so can you talk a little bit uh, – because I loved your TED Talks. One of the reasons why I reached out to you. I absolutely loved your TED Talk. Can, uh, you, talk, you. can you talk a little bit of – can you share a few of the points in your talk to the audience? Well, so the basic idea is that uh, there's this notion of exponential change. It's really hard for people to wrap our brains around what exponential change means. But the simplest way, I think, to grasp it is uh, is technology increases exponentially. So, So if you have a computer and you use that computer to build a better, faster computer, it's going to double – the output of it, right? Mm-hmm. So, but then that new computer, building a new computer, will double the output again. Mm-hmm. So rather than going step one to step two to step three to step four to step five, you go step one to step two to step four because you've doubled mm-hmm. to step eight because you've doubled it, and ten, you know, yeah. and go on look, and on and on. Exactly. And but this is the nature of progress. This is the nature of change. And and. I believe that the future is going to look radically different to today by essence, by, by the fact that everything is changing on this exponential scale. Mm-hmm. So we're early in the, in the exponential curve, which is why it doesn't seem all that groundbreaking. But if you actually go back and look at don't tell mom the babysitter's dead, <laughs> like many things about society are quite the same, but it's a dramatically different world that we live in. Oh and Jesus! It's, yeah, and, and it's going to get extremely dramatically different from here, uh, as you know, things like. Uh, well, look, I'll just use a perfect example. I, yeah. I since I live in LA, I just discovered. Maybe I'm old, but I just discovered Amazon Now. Okay. And I don't know if you know about Amazon Now. Which one is that? A- Amazon Now is you log on to Amazon. You can, uh. You can just place an order and it's at your doorstep in two hours. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's insane. Like that's <laughs> right. I, and at the first and literally the first time I did it, I was like, I'm gonna see if this is real. <laughs> right. I, I really was. I honestly, I'll order this. Sure. Sure. I'll I'll give you a tip. No problem. And <laughs> I really thought it was a scam. I'm like, nah. This is never gonna. Happen. And then de- de- an hour later, I hear a knock on the door. I'm like, wow, really? I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> so, so, but that's dis- that's delivery distribution, right? right? So, but take it another step further. What about 3D printing? What about oh, when you can go insane, onto yeah. Amazon yeah. and you say, I want this pair of pants, and your 3D printer prints the pants for you? Or take it another step and say, uh, I'm I'm hungry right now, and the 3D printer prints. A, a beautiful, healthy, organic meal for you. Star it's, Trek style. Star Trek style. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And and it, you know, what was once science fiction becomes imagination to the next generation of scientists who then turn it into reality. So there's no when we look at science fiction, we have to we have to realize someone's getting inspired by that sci-fi. And mm-hmm. this, if somebody sits and figures out how to make this happen, this may be our future. Well, so. It was just like what happened with Back to the Future too. Like that, that came out in the nine, I think nineteen ninety, yeah. and a lot of a lot of the stuff that they predicted has, came true. A lot of it didn't, but you well, know, sure, there is there is a hoverboard. You know, it's it's not like everyday stuff by Mattel. <laughs> That's the one that blows up, though, right? No, not that hoverboard. There's an actual hoverboard that uses the same technology. Well, levitation technology. Right. Yeah, there are trains that work on maglev. So yeah, it's it's insane. I mean, but I think I think I think the thing is that when the, the way we live our lives, because we're all sort of you know beholden to paying our bills and mm-hmm. whatever. I mean, we live our lives today. We imagine that the future will look like today, but a little more gadgety and a little faster, mm-hmm. right? But mm-hmm. but we're not paying attention to the fact that those changes are are. Are approaching how fast they get here is anyone's guess, but I think they're approaching faster than we imagine. So, you know, to me, I see the future as a as, as a very very different place than than what we exist what, what exists today in 2016. And that's basically the essence of the TED Talk, like to prepare yourself for what's coming. Well, and so the TED and so the TED Talk then takes that idea and says, you know, that this launched me into. Um, this launched me into this desire to make this film studio be, in part because um, 
Well, no. So I, I wanted to go into – I wanted to create movies and television entertainment about these ideas. But through the process of teaching, through the process of saying, okay, well, people have great ideas. I need great screenplays. How do we get them from here to here? And I sat down and I basically reverse engineer the process. Mm-hmm. Now, people don't understand this concept very well because a lot of people think fast screenplay is a, a screenwriting course, mm-hmm. which it's not. Mm-hmm. It's – at the end of the day, whatever technique you use, whether you use a three-act structure or you know whatever 10 other formulas are out there, everyone goes through the same process. The process is start with the idea, turn it into a story, get it on the page, shape it, reshape it until it's solid, make it a compelling read for the reader, and then connect it with the people that you're trying to reach, right? So that process – is the same. That's what I basically did. But through the act of reverse engineering that process, I came to see and appreciate and realize how creativity works and how imagination works Mm -hmm. and how we harness imagination and creativity and turn it into something that satisfies our own goals. But And so as you start to look at this on a, I guess, meta level... Mm -hmm you start to realize that, well, really every person on this planet goes through that same process during creativity, right? Mm -hmm. We all witness life through a different vantage point, right? You're seeing whatever you're seeing in this moment, wherever you are. And anyone who's listening to this is seeing something completely different to what you're seeing, completely different to what I'm seeing. Mm-hmm. And our backgrounds are all completely different as well. So we interpret it differently. So in, in I guess, this analogy, this metaphor that I came up with is that the earth is like a giant brain and we're like individual neurons. Mm-hmm. And so when we interact with each other, we're, we're sparking that other neuron right? Where Mm -hmm. when I say something to you that resonates with you, you go, oh, wow, that's really cool. And then you incorporate it into your thinking. And then Mm -hmm. that sort of informs where you go from there. Similarly, when you say something to me or I listen to one of your podcasts and I go, oh my God, that's so amazing. Or this person's fantastic. So writing, creativity, filmmaking, storytelling is that, right? So Mm -hmm. it's it's, when you're trying to tell a story, when you're trying to write a script, when you're trying to make a movie, you have an idea in your head that you're trying to share with other people, with an audience, with the world, right? Mm-hmm. You, want, you want the most people possible to hear your idea and to understand it and to connect with you and, and, and to inspire them. So it's all kind of the same thing. So then basically uh, – so, so let's back up for a second. You have a, uh, you have a system called uh, Fast Screenplay. Basically, it's okay. a it's a yes. system, correct? Because <laughs> yes. we kind of went into it first before explaining what fast screenplay was. Ah, so yes. can you can you break down the the seven parts, of, or did you already uh, the seven part system of fast screenplay? And okay, from so what and then from what I'm getting, just so I, I understand, it's not a like how to write a screenplay. It's a different kind of process to get the idea to the final end end point. Is that kind of what it is? Well, no, it's both. Okay. It's, so, okay. So well, let me, let me back up a second. So fast screenplay fast is an acronym. Mm-hmm. So it's all capital letters, mm-hmm. right? Focus is the F mm-hmm. a is for apply. S is for strengthen and T is for tweak. So what I realized when I sat down to sort of reverse engineer this process is that writing is a, there are four phases to writing. The first is to focus your ideas, where you basically take all the random ideas that you have and you focus them into a specific story, right? One, you choose, you choose and shape your, your story. Mm-hmm. Now, once you have your story, you have to get that onto the page. You have to write it, mm-hmm. which I call the apply phase. You're applying that story plan that you created, mm-hmm. right? So there's your first draft. Once you have your first draft, you have to rewrite. You have to strengthen it to make it in sync with your intentions. So make it the best story that it can be. Once you've got it being to be the best story, then you tweak the words, you polish it, you refine it so that the reader's experience when they read your script is there. It, it's a page turner. 
It's compelling. They want to go through this experience. So focus, apply, strength, and tweak is the writing process. So about, what, 10 years ago now, I wrote a book called Writing Fast, How to Write Anything with Lightning Speed, which mm -hmm. you can get on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, the Kindle version is really cheap. Anyway, so <laughs> – um, but that's the, that's the four-part writing process. Mm -hmm. Now, what I also realized was that if a writer goes out and starts just writing scripts, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're writing something that a producer like me could use. Mm -hmm. Right. So the only way that they're going to write something that I can say yes to is if they write something that is aligned with my needs. Right. right. So that doesn't necessarily mean they have to write for me. Maybe they write something that's so amazing. I want to make that film one way or another, though. We have to be aligned in order for us to say for me to say yes and for us to move forward and make the film. So what I realized was you could actually add a phase before this writing process, which I call the setup phase, which prepares you for the process and sort of pre-aligns your imagination with the needs of the producer. So that when you start the process of writing, your, your, your brain is, all, is serving up material to you that is in sync with producers' needs, right? So that you're not okay. sort of going off way on a tangent. But it's still your creativity. It's still whatever it is you want to write. Right. So then you go through that process. Once you're done, you're going to need to get notes and feedback. You're going to need to see how your work is interpreted and responded to by other people. So we have what I call the alignment phase. And that's basically you're sending your work out for notes and feedback. And how do you interpret notes and feedback? So many writers, and I've given notes over so many years now that it, writers drive me crazy because they take notes personally. Yep. They say, yeah, I they know. say, <laughs> how dare you not appreciate and respect the brilliance of what I wrote? And you're like, okay, I'm giving you a note telling you what the reaction to your work is. And rather than taking that and adapting your work so that it serves your goals, you're going to reject the note out of hand and take it like I've, like I've killed your baby. Right. So ego, ego, it, and egos, ego really gets in your way in, at that stage of it. Cause at the end of the day, we all write crap. Mm -hmm. I've written so much crap, it's not even funny, right? <laughs> right, right. Uh, arguably, maybe the things I'm talking about right now are <laughs> <laughs> But that's for someone else to decide. Right. But at the end of the day, uh, all the goal is not good or bad. Mm -hmm. The goal is creating something that is effective at what you're trying to get across. So the alignment phase helps you see what other people are getting and then adapt what, you, what you've created so that they get what you want what you want them to get mm -hmm. also teaches you the skill of, of adapting your work to the needs of a producer. If you want to go that road. Right? right. So then the final phase is the payoff phase, which is where now that you have this script, now that it's been through this process, now that it's aligned with, so you know, it's, you know, they like it, you know, it's what they want. How do you then connect with the producer and, uh, how do you identify what producers and how do you then connect with them? So mm -hmm. it, the whole system of fast screenplay, the seven phases, set up, focus, apply, strengthen, tweak, alignment, payoff. It's a, it's huge. <laughs> so yeah, of I, course. No, it's absolutely. It, it, and it's, so it probably takes about a year to learn the process. Mm -hmm. But I also have then subsequently distilled each of those steps so that once you get the whole process, you can then condense it and you can move through it and gradually make the process intuitive, mm -hmm. which is what leads to mastery. Right. So it's sort of this thing that looks daunting at the start, but it's really not because most writers think they know all this stuff and they really just don't. I mean, even intermediate, even advanced writers, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. there are things throughout the system that they just there we go. I never even thought of that before. Or this fills in a gap of something that I didn't know before. So the point, my point in creating the system mm -hmm. wasn't to teach screenwriting. I have no interest in becoming some screenwriting guru. This right. is not like I'm at the end of this road. I don't want I don't want this to be my life from here. I created this because if you're in Australia <laughs> and you can't find scripts and you don't have discretionary funds to pay writers to just develop stuff, which may or may not end up getting produced, because that's wasted money. And when every dollar counts, you can't spend that money. Mm -hmm. I basically needed an in-house 
script development system like a studio might have, but out of house, <laughs> right? right? Like I, I needed something that anyone could go start here, go through this, deliver something that we could make. So the idea was hopefully through this process, we'll end up getting uh, scripts and stories, some of which will be aligned with what we want to make, some of which writers will go off and find other producers. Uh, but then in theory, we'll gradually, as more people discover it, be able to make our three to six films a year and then hopefully change the world. So, ba- so then basically what, what you created Fast Screenplay was a selfish reason. You just want better screenplays. That's pretty much, yeah. <laughs> just, I want well, I want I want better screenplays and I don't want to have to write them myself. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so then uh, since I since you've already said you've read tons of scripts, thousands of probably yeah. over your lifetime, what are the most common mistakes you see with first-time screenwriters? Oh, uh, I mean, seriously the the it's across the board. Mm-hmm. You you have problems of <clears throat> Idea selection, mm-hmm. there's like people will have an idea and the, the kernel of the idea is good, but then they've turned it into a story that just doesn't really make any sense or, or is not the best expression. Look, think about the reasons why you, you watch a movie and you don't like the movie. I mean, how many movies do you watch where you go, that was awesome, like that was right. fantastic? Mm-hmm. Like it's actually few. Right? I, just actually, I just actually watched last night for the first time uh, The Grand Budapest Hotel. I love that movie. <laughs> and it was br- – I just loved it. Like my wife yeah. and I sat there and go, it's so unique. It's such a well-told story. It's so beautiful to look at. It's just yes. a gorgeous film. And that's like – and it's rare. And it's rare to actually hear yourself say, that was a good movie. And then, of course, I saw Spotlight and The Big Short and a bunch of the Oscar-nominated yep. films as well this year. But uh, just Grand Budapest, like, oh, we just have never got around to it. I was like, my God, that was really a good film. Well, and so if, – but if you think about then all the other films that you've seen that you sort of go, well, eh. it was good or eh, it was OK or, or you walk away going, geez, that was terrible. Like the, the reasons are – there are many different reasons for that. But it, now think about this as screenplays where you're going to have the same reaction. You know, the, you're not going to like every screenplay that you read, even if a screenplay might be good. I mean there are some awards contenders – uh, mm-hmm. This year, that mm, it's not my thing. <laughs> right, just, right. Of know, course, of course. I'm not into it. So, so we have that. We have you have uh, writers don't grasp the essence of the character uh, transformation. I mean, stories are about a character or a situation or something changing. Mm-hmm. So, what changes? It, if that change happens too fast or too slow, or it doesn't. It's doesn't. It's not plausible, or it's just not handled very well. All that can be problems. You have problems of dialogue. You have problems of structure, um, structure, grammar, <laughs> grammar. But it, but structure. I want to be clear. Just because it's not three act structure does not mean it has problems of structure. I think oh, there's this over reliance on the three act structure. I've got a video series that I'm working on at the moment that'll should be up end of February or so mm-hmm. on the YouTube channel. But that uh, that addresses why our reliance on the three act structure is maybe a little a little too extreme. Right. right. Um, that's one story form. But at the end of the day, a, a film structure has to be right for it. It has to be right for what you're trying to say and and how you're trying to say it and the point and purpose that you're trying to get across. Well, yeah, so, like, like watching Pulp Fiction in a different structure. Like if you did a three a, yeah. a proper three act structure in chronological order, that movie doesn't have the same zing. To Absolutely. It. You know. That's absolutely true. Um, and so, so there. But so when I say that there, that most films have structural problems, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's that they're not adhering to three act though. So it's mm-hmm. it's. Uh, but but yes, yeah, structure is a huge problem for for a lot of writers, and and you know also just writing style is a big thing. People don't necessarily appreciate, but if you're reading lots of scripts, um, there's something to be said for like a really great writing style like something mm-hmm. that just pops off the page and um and implies more than it says you know there's, there's screenwriting requires an economy of words that writers often don't fully appreciate where mm-hmm. in some ways you want to use three words instead of 10 but you want those three words to say more than the 10 would have right so it, it's it, it there's a lot in the in the white space there's a lot in the in the there's a lot that's implied that should be implied in the way a great screenplay reads. And if writers can really learn to play with that, mm-hmm. um, 
it, it'll make their it'll make their scripts jump out a lot better. I know there's some uh, some screenwriters that when you read because I've read so many bad screenplays in my life, uh, mine mine included. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm I'm in the same boat. Yeah, my, mine in, mine included without question. Some of my earlier efforts are like oh my oh, god, ooh, some rough stuff. Um, but <laughs> um, but then you read uh, Shane Black's uh, old stuff like yeah. you know Lethal Weapon and. Last it can be a bit hammy, but yeah, it's. I mean, no, obviously for the time period, but yeah. still, the stu- you can see that voice is so clear. Walter Hill, back in the yeah. day, uh, John Milius, you know, who was an insane writer, and of course Tarantino, uh, and a million other right. But when you start reading those guys, they all have very, very unique voices. Absolutely, and, and they and it pops right off the page. Like you, you read a Shane Black script, you, it's Shane Black. You read it, obviously Tarantino probably has the loudest of all of those voices. Yeah, um, you <laughs> but know. there's some there's there's a danger though. Also also with that because uh, often the scripts that you find online are um, – some of the most beloved scripts that you find online are written by writer-directors. And right. uh, if you're writing a screenplay on spec, if you're, if you're not going to make your own film, um, then – you have to be careful because there are certain things that writer directors will do. They'll include shots or they'll include yes. certain yes. language that uh, that they can get away with because they're describing how they're going to film it. But as the as the as the writer submitting your project, um, trying to get a story made, you don't want to include that stuff because you really want the creative team that is going to ultimately say yes and make your film. You want them to infuse their own creative vision into it, and so if you steer it too much from a, you know, a control standpoint, mm-hmm. then um, it, it's a turnoff to the reader. And and you know, I, I can't tell you how many times you read a script, and it's like, okay, you think you're directing this, right? Uh, and and that's uh, yeah, uh, you, this isn't even written well enough, so like let alone directed well enough, you know? Yeah, I, I've, 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 I was told many years ago. Um, you know, by many different people, like don't put direction in a script unless you're directing it. If you're directing it, do what you want, but generally don't put like close up here, no, dolly never, in no. here. Like don't do that because exactly for that reason. Like, yeah, obviously a Tarantino movie will have that because he's going to direct it. But like right. if you read, um, you know, Shane Black's last uh, last Boy Scout, which was – he wasn't a director back then or Lethal Weapon. He yeah. wasn't a director back then. Those scripts just – I mean they are 80s and they are – you, they are what they are, but they're so well put together. I mean, and I still put up Lethal Weapon as one of the best action films. Uh, oh, you know, I agree, of course. Of, of, and, and Die Hard. I mean, Jesus. I mean, absolutely. But and they stand the test of time because the stories are so rich, the characters correct. are so well written, and the and the pacing and the tension and the oh, it's just know. it's masterful. It's masterful to watch. Like you know, considering like watching an an action movie today. And then mm-hmm. watching Lethal Weapon One, Two, Predator, the original Predator, yep. or Die Hard, those sure. '80s action movies that are just like you could pop them in right now, and they <laughs> do their job. Like they will do their job so well. I mean, even Star Wars, for that matter, the original Star Wars. I mean, that was done Absolutely. in the '70s. There's not many movies that were done in the '70s that hold to today. Like you could put Star Wars in right now. I'll put right. it on for my six year old. And well, hang on though. Part of that is is because uh, the setting isn't the seventies. Correct, but the right. storytelling is yes. universal forever. Yeah, obviously, yeah. Well, but, but like the Godfather, you could put the Godfather on, and it still holds very much. Yeah. Though the pacing is a little different than what people are used to today, especially now with the new seven hour version being released on HBO. <laughs> <laughs> of uh, Godfather One and Two, which I'm really interested. In. I'm not sure if I have the time to watch that. Well, that's the big question, then. How, like, who has the time to watch it? Who's going to sit down and watch seven hours of the Godfather? <laughs> I, think, I think one of the frustrating things for me at the moment, though, is that you know we have we are technologically capable of making extraordinary stuff today. Oh, God, and yeah. and and one of the biggest I think letdowns is story and script development because mm-hmm. because people. People are so enamored of the production process and the post-production CG and editing, all that stuff. The stuff that, the stuff that all you really need are the tools, and you can start tinkering. Mm-hmm. When it comes to writing, we all have the tools. <laughs> to, to start tinkering is a little harder because it's there's no defined shape to what it's supposed to look like, and you know you can you can write in anything. You could write on the back of a napkin at the end of the day. Right. It's not you know the what you write on, how you write is not the most important thing. What's important is taking that idea, turning it into a compelling story. And, and the, there's this almost pervasive attitude of, of well, I'm just going to bang out a script 
you know, I'm just going to spend two weeks or three weeks knocking out my screenplay and I'm ready to go. <laughs> right. And it's like, you, you, you wouldn't, ex- I remember doing a workshop, a live workshop in Melbourne, uh, in Australia once. And this woman had attended and she was a novelist mm-hmm. and she made, um, these epic fantasy novels. Like each novel would have 800 pages. She had mm-hmm. multiple trilogies on the bookshelf at the, at the local bookstore. And, right. um, and she was – she had come to do my screenwriting workshop because she said in between my big 800-page novels, I usually have a month or two off and I'll – I thought I'd bang out a script between them. Oh, and wow. I thought, okay. So uh, so I met up with her like six months later and I said, how is it all going? <laughs> she said, I was amazed to discover that it's as much work to write a screenplay as it is to write an 800-page novel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and if oh, I could, if I could, if I could just let that point sink into the <laughs> minds of every writer I encounter, oh my God, life would be so much better. Because if you, if you, if you realize that that's the amount of effort and skill and nuance that you have to use, I think you would treat the whole thing much more seriously. And if you treat it more seriously, you're, you're more likely to create better quality. I mean, I don't know how old you are, but the you know when we're, I was we're about younger, the we're, we're about the same vintage, I think. Uh, uh, probably, so, you're so, a little younger, probably. I'm not sure. Okay, so we so what you know, but when we were young, we probably wrote stuff. We probably tried to make stuff. You look back at it now, and it was terrible. But mm. new writers don't have the benefit of that, so they assume that what they're creating is great, even <laughs> though, like, when yeah. I create something, if I write today, mm. I'm assuming it's not good enough you know right. i'm going into it with the assumption that i'm seeing those those early drafts of stuff that i wrote 20 years ago so you know what you know what's interesting with you saying i don't mean to cut you off but what's interesting yeah. with what you're saying is it's so so true because when you're when i started writing at the beginning or, or creating things at the beginning of my career i just assumed that they were awesome Right. <laughs> just, well, just, and you only can't not. I mean, that's kind of where the inspiration comes from. So you, right. you can't berate yourself and assume it's awful. Otherwise, no, you're never going to keep going. No, but there's a sense of uh, there's a sense of being hu- humbling as as life as life beats you down and the business beats you down as you go through it. And this at, at, this is at every level. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel that a certain time, like now, I sit down and create something. I don't assume all of a sudden it's awesome. I ha- I beat it up a lot more. I look at it more. I analyze it more to see yes. to see if it's like I I I put it to the test to see if it holds up. Where at the first, like you would just put something out there and you're like, oh look, and then the world will beat it up for you. As Absolutely. Opposed- <laughs> and, and they'll do a great job, by the way. They do a fantastic <laughs> job doing that. But you know, I, I really think it's it's also in how you interpret things. So if you if 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 if, if when you say the world beats you down or, or you get beat up for your story uh, on some level, all, all that the world is really doing and saying to you is mm-hmm. that you're out of alignment, right? You're not what you think you're trying to achieve. You haven't presented in a way that is achievable yet. And, and mm-hmm. if you, if you, I think if in general, we, not you specifically, but right. we all start to look at, the negatives at the rejections at the nose mm-hmm, mm-hmm, at the mm-hmm. at the criticisms if we look at that through that filter of well okay so the thing that i put out there didn't resonate why um it i think it it will help us improve it helps us it helps us adapt uh, refine because ultimately success is available to absolutely anyone who wants it yep. it really is because all that you have to do is not give up. That's it. I like to say there's only two outcomes for screenwriters. Either you're going to see your movie going to you're going to see your movie made, your script made into a movie or you're going to quit. That's it. There's no other option. Mm-hmm. No, if someone I, says I, no, <laughs> then you adapt, you refine, you keep persisting until you get it made as a movie. You know, the, I always use I've used this uh, um, example on the show before, but The Matrix. Uh, yes. I heard the story of The Matrix on a documentary I was watching uh, probably with like a year ago or something, and what I found out was that the script was you know so obviously revolutionary and 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 the story was so out there that people didn't really understand it. It took so long to get it made. It took about four to five years. 
yep. to get made. And in, in that time, they shot Bound, uh, the, the Warshawski brothers at the time shot Bound uh, to kind of prove that they could direct it. But during that five-year period, they were beating the hell out of the script. Yep. They were rewriting it and rewriting it. and re- So by the time they finally got to make it, that was the tightest script in the world. <laughs> they, they, Absolutely. They beat that thing up so much. So by the time it got released into the world – the world couldn't do any more beating. They couldn't. They couldn't <laughs> right. tear it down. They've they've made something so structurally sound that there's yeah. it could it, 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 there's nothing you can do to, to tear it down. It was just it was just it's like Shawshank Redemption. You watch Shawshank Redemption, you just go, there's I, I I can't yeah. I can't say. Though anytime I feel bad, I do look up bad review Shawshank Redemption, <laughs> and there well, are yeah. there are some by the way, I, and I love reading them because they're just like you idiot. <laughs> well, this is an interesting point because ultimately. Uh, I, I used to use exactly that as an example in, in my live workshops. I, I would say, you know, ultimately, there will always be people who hate what you do. Always. There will always be people who try to knock you down or not even maliciously. Maybe they just genuinely don't like it. Don't you about but right. that's OK. I mean, if you if you go back to that brain metaphor analogy, you know, not everything that you put out into the world is going to electrify all the other neurons in the system, right? No. It's only – all that matters is is that it lands with where you're trying to land it, you know? Exactly, exactly. Now, can you can you talk a little bit about this free course that you were – that you've been working on for a year, the fast story development, how to create the detailed well, – Yeah, so, I, so it's, uh, it's a, it's a four-part uh, YouTube video series. So if you, if you haven't been to my YouTube channel, check it out. Um, there's a lot of me talking, <laughs> but, uh, it's youtube.com slash fast screenplay. Uh-huh. And there are what 30 videos or something like that there at the moment. And this one is a four part series. So one, one of my biggest challenges is, uh, helping people really understand what fast screenplay is all about. So I wanted to do something that was both simultaneously really quality information people could use and run with immediately, but also something that through through explaining that helps you really understand what what fast then is all about. So it's a it's a four part series that's called uh, fast story development: how to create detailed original stories in one hour. Mm-hmm. And so it's got four parts. And the first part is the hidden story dynamic. So as I'm reverse engineering this process. I'm looking at the three act structure. Why does it work when it works? Why doesn't it work when it doesn't work? Um, and I realize that there's this sort of hidden story dynamic underneath it all, sort of what I call the building block of all storytelling. But that building block then also applies to, you know, infinitely beyond just storytelling. It's almost like the building block of anything that we choose to do which means you can actually apply it to story development as well. So in part two, it's called how to grow stories organically, where you basically start with an idea and you more or less just grow it organically into a compelling screen story. Mm -hmm. So I walk you through that. Now, once you've walked you through that, then part three is how you can do that entire process in one hour. So I walk you through that. And then uh, part four is why you'd even want to do this, why speed actually turns out to be the key to writing success. Mm -hmm. So um, each each one's like about 10 minutes, a little less than 10 minutes long. And uh, and they're they're full of animation and all this stuff, which is what has been taking me so long. Firstly, nailing it down. So it's. So it, you know, the pacing and all, all the normal stuff, make sure that it's, uh, it's effective and enter- entertaining, but also that it is legitimately helpful. I think all four episodes are just packed with stuff that people will be able to use immediately, whether they continue on to fast screenplay or whether they go off and do their own thing. It's it, my goal. My goal has never been to be a screenwriting teacher. So ultimately, mm-hmm. if you don't join me, as, that's not the end of the day for me. I like I fast is. Uh, fast is not about making a profit. We, all proceeds that come into fast get reinvested into fast to make it bigger and faster and uh, to make it, you know, expand it exponentially, as you said, yeah, exponentially, <laughs> eventually. Yeah. 
Um, so it's, I mean, it's, you know, I want to make my money off of the movies that I make eventually. Right. right. So I'm not, I, I don't, I don't take a, I don't take a salary from fast or any of that stuff that I really want people to do fast because it's going to help them get where they want to go fast. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> ultimately fast has multiple meanings. There's the idea of writing it fast, but really there's no point in writing something fast if it's crap. Right. right, right. So the only fast screenplay actually refers to the, the speed at which the screenplay reads. Mm-hmm. So when mm-hmm. I, as a, as a producer, when I, if I'm, if I'm looking at a screenplay to evaluate it, if it's a slow read, there's no way it's going to be bought. It's just not going to happen. Right. 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 Like if it's a fast read, that means it's a page turner. That means it's grabbed me. It's pulled me in. Mm-hmm. I'm there. Mm-hmm. I want to see what happens next. So a fast screenplay is a screenplay that reads fast. It's a screenplay that people want to find out what happens next for. That's what everyone wants to write. That's what you should want to write. Now, writing that fast requires mastering a whole lot of skills and nuances and details, character structure, Mm -hmm. theme, setting, all that stuff, right? Right. So to master it, it's going to take a little bit of time. So you go through the fast screenplay system, which is the acronym which is the system and the and the process itself? Well, we come to the part of the show that I ask uh, the same three questions to all of my all of my guests. So these are the toughest questions you'll ever have. So be prepared Uh-oh. yourself. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I didn't listen to other ones to prepare. So Uh-oh. this is new to me. Uh-oh. Okay. Um, <laughs> what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn in life or in the film business? The lesson that took me the longest to learn. Um. That's a good question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you often have people uh, stumped looking at the wall? For a second, but it comes to them. <laughs> I think I think the, the probably is that I'm enough. Yeah, I've, that's that's a that's an answer I've heard from other yeah. guests as well. It's, yeah, you know, look, it's funny because my you know all along, and I I often attribute it to growing up trying to be an actor in L.A. Mm-hmm. You really, I mean. It was an actor. It was an actor who said that, by the way. As a, well, as a kid, it's, it doesn't surprise me. As a kid, I went to uh, probably, without exaggeration, a thousand auditions, and I probably booked about fifty parts. Mm-hmm. And that's a lot of rejection, right? I'm mm-hmm. too, I'm too thin. I'm too fat. I'm too tall. I'm too short. I'm mm-hmm. too good looking. I'm not. I'm ugly. I'm all all that Everything. stuff, right? Yeah. So on some level, I always attributed it to to that that. I I hadn't felt like it was okay to express my creative core. And so through teaching writing, I, I think it was only through teaching writing. I never wanted to be a writing teacher. That was I never would have imagined back then that that's what I that that's what I would be doing today. Mm-hmm. But in many ways, through doing that, it's helped me realize and appreciate. No, because because I see the insecurities in every single person, every writer. You can see the insecurities, and it's like, no, just trust it, trust this, trust you. If mm-hmm. you trust, I always tell people, if you can trust me, you can trust my system. That will turn into a trust for yourself. Mm-hmm. And so, in some ways, I'm trying to convey that very lesson to everyone that I teach. Good answer, sir. Um, <laughs> what is your top three films of all time? Oh, see, that's always a killer. Yeah. It could be just the ones you've listened. They could come to mind today. Um, well, I think it's hard to go past Shawshank Redemption just because it's such a, just such a flawless film. Right. It's a beautiful piece of, of filmmaking. Uh, I don't want to, I, here's the thing. I don't know that I could say of all time because I, I find value yeah. in even crappy films. 
Of course, I do too. Like there's some there's some like eighty schlock that I'll watch, and you know I love watching Commando. <laughs> like Commando is awesome. Yeah, but there it's a go. horrendous film. It's horribly right. structured. <laughs> there's cardboard cutouts that are being blown up as soldiers. I mean, it's a horrible, <laughs> horrible, horrible film. But I love it. So um, yes, I completely feel. So just three favorite films that really tickle you. Uh, well, I'll tell you one that I saw recently. I don't know if I would call it as as an all time favorite, but I loved it. It's a tiny little indie film called Coherence. Okay, I haven't heard if that. If you're, one. if you're, since you're in an indie film uh, podcast, I think your listeners would probably love this film. It's made on a tiny budget. I don't even know what it, like micro budget, mm-hmm. and it's just such a cool idea, and it's really well executed, and it shows you what can be done, and it's also sci-fi in a cool sort of way that i like i don't want to say too much about it because it actually gives away sure sure uh sort of the core premise of it but that have you seen a movie called primer yeah of course okay so it's it's not like primer in that sense but it's that low budget indie thing where they've done something really really cool oh very cool Um, coherence okay yeah i mean i'm a huge sort of time travel and sci-fi nut i love those kinds of stories so so back to the um, future obviously (laughs) <laughs> Back to the Future is uh, – there's another flawless film. You, it, there yeah, are some films that literally – they are flawless. You can't – You can't pick it apart. nothing you no. would change, even yeah. down to you know Casting. the twitch on the actor's face. Like yeah. it's yeah. just flawless. So um, – yeah, I, uh, those are three. Those are three right there. Yeah, I don't want to beat you up too much. Um, what but was? I lo- but I have a I have a very wide variety of. I like obscure films and and for you know what another one is great one is Cinema Paradiso. Oh, you know that I love one? Cinema Paradiso. Yeah, oh. if any film any film lover any any movie lover. Yeah, would love well it. maybe that's it. That. Yeah, you just <laughs> as got a film lover. Yeah, as a film lover, you just watch that. And you just go, oh. <laughs> another good one is uh, Living in Oblivion. Oh, I love Living in Oblivion. <laughs> anyway, uh, so we're gonna get on to that. Yeah, if, if you're a filmmaker, everyone out there, you must look for a movie called Living in Oblivion. I'll put it in the show notes. Oh my! It sure. is. It is Steve Buscemi. Early Steve Buscemi. Early Steve Buscemi. It's a movie about making movies, and. Yep. Oh, when Peter I, Dinklage has the greatest oh, so, bit part in the history of time. And and Fantastic. my favorite part of the one of my favorite parts is when the grip pulls out the screenplay and gives it to the producer. Exactly. It's like I have this oh screenplay God. I've been working on and I'm Can like I tell you how oh, often that happens. Oh my God. <laughs> but he carries the screenplay in his back pocket. That's what right. I remember. It was so vividly. It's like he's just like busted out and gives it to him. Just, <laughs> State in Maine is another great one. Oh, uh, State in Maine is fantastic. State in Maine is another great movie making movie. A movie about movie making is absolutely, absolutely. brilliant. Who was that? Uh, Mamet, right? That was Mamet, wasn't it? Mamet, Philip yeah. Seymour Hoffman, and oh, uh, Alec, Alec Baldwin's Baldwin. the actor. Oh, so brilliant. Oh, that's um, wonderful. And then can you name one under really underrated film? Uh, we probably probably did there a few. Um, I'll tell you know what I'm going to go on record as saying: mm-hmm. Star Wars: The Force Awakens. <laughs> <laughs> very under, tell you what. very underrated yeah. film, is it? No, no, no spoilers, but go ahead. That movie has gotten a lot of a lot of flack from, oh, wow. especially from industry people or people who are saying that it's just a a rip off of uh, uh, a New l- Hope, l- and l- you know th- that it's not. Cr- I here's I, the thing about that movie. I love that you've called this the most underrated film. You, I love it. You're going to you are well only only because there I know there's a lot of haters uh, yeah. on, about that film. But you're going to look at this film after the next two come out and see brilliance in the Force Awakens mm-hmm. that you can't see right now. Because I my, one of my one of the whole sort of principles upon which everything I do is built is the notion of setup and payoff. Yeah. I believe that that is sort of the core of it all, right? So everything is either set up or pay off. And that movie is set up, set up, set up, set up. And it's fantastic. It's just going to pay off in amazing. I'm so, I've always been a Star Wars fan. I didn't mm-hmm. like the prequels, but I, I, I'm, I'm not a geek fan. I'm just, I'm just an appreciative fan. Mm-hmm. That is like, I'm just so excited about what they've done with that. And, and where they're uh, going with the whole thing, and I, and I think it gets derided from a, especially from a screenwriting standpoint, mm-hmm. because everyone's only looking at the similarities mm-hmm. to A New Hope, and they're not, uh, they're not appreciating why those similarities are likely to be there. 
Yeah, look, and it's I, I look. They will. Um, I am uh, I am actually and it's a very well documented uh, Star Wars full blown geek. Okay, there um, you go. <laughs> on, you know, as so do you know things like the Ring Theory and all that. No, I'm not that. I don't go that okay, deep. But, right. but I, I but I carry Yoda close to me at all times. Okay. <laughs> You see, he's always with me <laughs> at all times. Um, so I, uh, I'm a that big, is more geek than me. <laughs> it is much more. Geek. I have a life size Yoda here in my office. It's, it's. I've had him for wow, um, twelve that's years. Pretty cool. Actually. Yeah, it's. I've had him. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I could. I could. I don't want to go down the geek road because I could. <laughs> I could go hard, really, really quickly. But the thing is, I saw the movie and I, I, I loved it, and I'm a big fan of it, and I can't wait to go see it again. But. I just enjoyed it, and I enjoyed the the trip and the 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 the, the whole thing that JJ did with it, and he did it so nicely and so tightly. And there is a lot of haters out there, but I don't I don't I don't personally care. And I know there's a lot of, but there's more lovers than haters because it's made two billion. No, I mean that, look, there, <laughs> there are, and I'm and that movie will be just fine whether it's got me as its defender yes, or not. Yes, exactly. Uh, but but just but only because the the sort of circle that I've been playing in for a while is the screenwriting and screenwriting education. Stamps, sure, you know, all sure, that sort sure. of thing. It, within that world, it's it's it gets consistently bashed, and oh, I but, think it's just so unfair because it's um, it's far more remarkable than it appears to be on the surface. It's also just a great ride. Do you know what I mean? Oh yeah, that, it's just there's, that's there's icing that. on the cake. It's but underlying that is 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 quite a stunning achievement, in my opinion. And that he's created probably one of the best uh, hero uh, female hero uh, heroes. Yeah, in the heroine. last yeah. in, in heroine in the last twenty years, if not longer, yeah, because uh, she's amazing. Ray's character, that character, is absolutely remarkable. Well, uh, and I think there will be some. I think there will be some cool reveals. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah. In, should, in future episodes, we, yeah. we won't. We won't. We won't go down too far. <laughs> but and, and and going the same route where you were talking about the um the screenwriters kind of you know snubbed their nose at it. They also snubbed their nose at Titanic, and they also snubbed their rose at Avatar. And as Avatar is just Fern Gully, it's just uh, dances with no, wolves. But so you know that actually makes a re- brings up a really interesting point because I'm also a fan of Avatar. I yeah. think um, I, the, they're mistaking the mythological structure mm-hmm. for copycatting. Right? right, right. So the in order if you. So in the hands of a hack writer, a truly hack writer, mm-hmm. um, you, he, he would copy Ferngully and it would not have the same resonance as Avatar does. Mm-hmm. But what Cameron has done I – mean, Cameron's a, an exceptional film. I mean not just box office <laughs> he's, successes. No, he's but an like, amazing filmmaker. He actually, is, he actually is really good at what he does. Yes. He, and he's another one that gets derided a lot, um, which is – by the way, this doesn't – I'm not trying to imply that I'm only about the blockbustery kind sure, of, of writing. Course not. I no. love the, I love obscure cinema and L- experiments. L- living too. in oblivion, you know those. I mean, that's totally. a, a very small movie. So, but, yeah. so, but I think you have to respect. I always judge something based on what is it that they were trying to achieve, mm-hmm. and did they achieve it effectively? So by that, by that, you if you look at a screenplay or you look at store a story through that filter. Um, a lot of these things that look to be simplistic or plagiaristic or mm-hmm, what, mm-hmm, copycat mm-hmm. are actually not. They're they're using the mythological structure in a completely original way. And mm-hmm. so, you know, Avatar is I would if you had done this podcast back then, yeah. I probably would say that Avatar is the most underrated. So right. I um I think it's important for writers and filmmakers in general to understand the big mythological structures to understand. Most people don't understand the three act structure. They understand (laughs) where the things happen, but they don't understand why the things happen, where they happen. So that's what leads to hackism. That's what leads to people copying something ineffectively. Right. But if you understand why the why behind all of it, you can use the, the structures to your own advantage, or you can play around with the structures and come up with something new and different in a way that is also effective. Jeff, I won't take up any of your, <laughs> of your time. This is we've right. get, we've geeked out a little bit too much. <laughs> uh, hope, hope, hope the audience didn't mind, but <laughs> uh, but there's some good no, there's some good knowledge in that geek out as well. So uh, hopefully, that hopefully something hopefully somebody learned something today. <laughs> um, nice. <laughs> so oh, so where can people find you, sir? 
Uh, the probably the easiest place is to go to uh, fastscreenplay.com mm-hmm. or uh, or the YouTube channel youtube.com slash fast screenplay mm-hmm. uh, or just Google my name or writing fast or fast screenplay. <laughs> Great. And I'll have links to everything we've discussed in the show notes as always, guys. So sounds good. Jeff, thank you again so much for taking out the time, man. I really Thanks appreciate sure. it. I appreciate it. I had a great time. I hope you guys learned something from that episode. Jeff was a, a ball to talk to, man. And we did geek out a bit on the show, so please forgive us. But I think there's some knowledge that got mixed in there somewhere with all that geeking geeking out. So I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. As always, if you need the show notes, they are at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 099, and I'll have links for all the things we discussed in this episode. And guys, if you guys have not taken the Werner Herzog Masterclass, I'm telling you, I've gone through it. It's pretty pretty remarkable, especially for 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 people like myself who've been in the business for 20 years. You definitely pick up a bunch of cool stuff, but for someone starting out, my God, I would have killed for something like this uh, when I was first starting out. So just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash masterclass and uh, definitely check it out. Werner Herzog, remarkable, remarkable course. And guys, uh, the next episode is going to be episode 100. And I am still thinking of what I can do to make it a special episode. Uh, I'm working on it, but you will get something soon <laughs> for episode 100. So, But before I even go uh, into episode 100, I want to thank everybody, uh, all the fans, all the tribe members who have uh, been listening and supporting what we do, or what, excuse me, what I do here at Indie Film Hustle and, uh, and with the podcast as well. So thank you so much. And and. I get. I mean, I'm getting so many messages from you guys on uh, Facebook and Twitter and email, telling me your stories and and how this podcast has uh, inspired you and helped you and guided you through your filmmaking journey. And my God, it's it's so humbling to hear all these amazing stories. So, guys, please uh, and 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 also pay it forward, man. You know, if you learn something, share that information with somebody else. Don't ever feel that you have to hold on to knowledge because, oh, my God, if I give it to that guy, he might take a job away from your job. Don't think that way. You can't think about things like that. You know, high tide raises all boats, and that's how you have to look at it. You know, the more information out there, the better movies that are being made, the better for everybody and the better for the whole industry and the whole, the whole kit and caboodle, as they say. So please pay it forward. Spread the word. Please let everybody know about the podcast. Let everybody know about the website. And uh, and hopefully we can keep helping more and more filmmakers uh, and hopefully new generations of filmmakers coming up to make better and better and better content, better stories, and uh, better art. And hopefully that will change the world just a little bit because art is extremely powerful, guys. Movies, cinema is extremely powerful. And as I always say, it is your responsibility to get your out your art out into the world because you have no idea how it will affect somebody else. Thanks again, guys. Keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I will talk to you in episode 100. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.